誒、呃、同事嘅數目夠啦嚇，我哋。We have a quorum. So, Dr. Edward Yu. 三分鐘可以做完嘅。Three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Well, as I just said to the Secretary, I want to express my deep dissatisfaction. Last time, out of good intention, I pointed out to you that the so-called successful DBO exam to samples aren't really successful. But last time, you denied, and then you uh, said that I interpreted. Wrong. You said that DBO's definition refers to procurement, but not f uh, funding, and you did not justify your explanation. I want to read it out to you. This is the definition coming from the World Bank. Project the public sector owns and finance the construction of new assets. The private sector designs, builds, and operates the asset to meet certain agreed outputs. The documentation for a DBO is typically simpler than a BOT or a concession, as there are no financing documents, and will typically consist of a turnkey construction contracts plus an operating contract. Well, I'll do a little gaua. Well, I'll stop reading here. I'm quoting from the World Bank's definition on DBO, which sets out very clearly the difference with the BOT model is on financing. And you said that the World Bank's definition is wrong. I don't know where your definition comes from. You have not quoted from anything. You just insist that you're right, so I cannot even talk to you. I don't trust your paper at all because. I don't know where your definition comes from. I don't even know what Kai Tech you refer to means. You're defining your own Kai Tech. So that's your logic. That's your definition. That's your terminology. Why don't you write a letter um, with me, carbon copied, to the World Bank, putting it to them that their definition is wrong? Can we do that? Any response, Secretary? Chairman, about the definition, I think the consultant can supplement in a minute. But just last time, Dr. Edward, you raised some questions on those examples, and we therefore already asked the consultant to explain in detail these examples. Of course, Dr. Yu may have a different interpretation. He might have different views. I hope that the consultant can reply to him in greater detail. Perhaps be before they do, can I ask Dr. Edward Yu to uh, treat, take it that he press the button another time so that you have another two minutes? What does pressing the button mean? Can you explain? That means using your finger to to, to press the button, right? Um, that's my instruction as chairman. If you press the button again, you can have another two minutes right away instead of waiting in the queue again, so as to make the meeting more effective. So I press the button for you. At I take it that you're speaking for the fourth round, secretary. Okay, all together four minutes so that you can get a complete answer. Who would, who would answer, please? For the comments and questions, I. I think on this one is where we have a difference of opinion, and I'll explain why we have a difference of opinion. Procurement models for different projects are different all over the world and including in Hong Kong. No two single contracts are the same. A DBO model, as I've said earlier, can involve a number of different features from one DBO to the next, some of which may include funding, some of which may not include funding. The point is the underlying principle and the underlying philosophy that government is pursuing for the project is a design, build and operate team all together to deliver a package solution. In terms of your comment about funding and the definition of funding, what we're talking about here is a brand or a name, DBO versus DBFO versus BOT. You have to look beyond the name and look to the substance of the contract. And the substance of the contract in each of these examples and the Kaitak Sports Park is design, build and operate in a single consortium to deliver a package solution. I hope this answers your question. 
you can ask follow-up questions. So, Secretary, please answer me. Are you going to write this letter to the World Bank to point out to them that their definition is wrong? Secretary. Well, I, I think that he was talking to the consultant. No, he, he said that he disagrees. He said that the letter should be written to the World Bank to help the world understand. But uh, I heard, also heard very clearly that we have the, you have different opinions, all right? The World Bank doesn't have all the say supplement uh, uh, from the consultant, anything? Well, so what is the, the definition that you use? Can you quote the source? Uh, quote the source of your definition. The, so the source, to explain this again, this is not about the name or the definition or the acronym. It's about the philosophy of the procurement and the commercial arrangements and the social arrangements behind the contract structure. So, so you're making this up? World Bank, right? So, so he's asking. Yes. World Bank, he's assuming World Bank is the only authority able to make a definition. So what are, why, why do you think that's not true? So the World Bank does work in infrastructure, of course, like many other multilateral institutions, corporate institutions, government bodies. There are many ways of looking at this and many ways of interpreting it. But the underlying philosophy is the same. For DBO, the acronym is very clear, DBO, Design, Build, Operate. And that's the philosophy of the Kaitak Sports Park. And it's the same for the, pro the projects we have given. So whether we agree with the World Bank definition or not is not the question we're, we're trying to respond to here. It's are these examples consistent in philosophy and concept? And we, we believe, our opinion is yes, they are the same. I don't think you meet, can ever meet eye to eye because you have different views. Well, no, it's not about us having different views. You have quoted four so-called DBO successful examples and you are misleading the Hong Kong public and members. Uh, thinking that other people also have the government paying for the project and they were successful and why would we not agree? I'm telling you, it is not that the government's paid all the money. And then you said, I have misinterpreted it. And I said, no, I am following the World Bank um, definition. And you say you are following your own philosophy, that you are going by another definition. I think we are surviving in two different worlds. How can I have a meeting with you? Your time is up, Mr. Wu Chi Wai, four minutes. Uh, please press the button again if you want to ask another question. Mr. Wu Chiwai, Chairman, I think Dr. Yu had made a very important point indeed. We asked a question and then you use the language of another world to answer us. Then there is no way we can have a dialogue. Chairman, you should ask the Bureau Secretary or the consultant to redefine the basic understanding of DBO. What kind of criteria should we use as the basis for discussion? Or else we would be existing in different philosophical spheres. Here, I'd like to ask the Secretary another question, or I may even ask for a written reply, because he did not answer my question that I asked last time. I said, in the DBO mode, the operator may have to consider public interest and his own interest, and there will be a conflict of roles as well as interests. The Secretary said uh, they will set a kind of stakeholders management committee in order to watch over the entire project in order to find a balance. I asked him whether the operators, potential ones, would have to comment on this in the bits so that we know what the future operator thinks about resolving the conflict between the public interest and his own interest, or else a phenomenon will ensue, and that is if he puts too much emphasis on public interest, it may affect his own interest. And then in the end, if he thinks it is not a kind of break even for him, he may quit. So I think from the stage of calling for tenders, you should already add in this element. Then you can know what the bidder thinks about this part or else you are just delaying.
the emergence of the conflict. Secretary. Yes, this is an important concern. That is how we can protect the public interest and the government's interest. Therefore, before tendering, we will set some indicators and the bidders will need to respond to those. After these indicators are set, then at the time of operation, there will be public monitoring. The public will be able to participate. No, Chairman, I'm asking you whether this will be factored into tendering documents requiring bidders to comment on it. That is in your tendering documents. Chairman, if you are only talking about a possible conflict of roles or conflict of interests, uh, if you only talk about the principles, it will not be very meaningful. But there will be concrete, specific requirements and indicators and targets so we can protect the public interest. But of course, we have to balance this against the contractor's business operation. Therefore, at the time of tendering and at the time of operation, there will be monitoring. Well, my question was very simple, wasn't it? Because in my view, for the operator, he wants to operate for 25 years, but the public interest may change as Times pa time passes. Therefore, I'm asking that the bidder should be asked to think through this at the time of tendering. And it will help you decide whether the bidder will be willing to try to find the balance. Would that be too difficult for you, Secretary? The, the uh, question is very simple, and my answer has been very clear. The specific criteria are the important point because we can then protect the public interest. Ms. Lao Siulai, three minutes. Thank you. I think Dr. Yu's point was so important. It goes to show that the government should not cite these four examples to say that uh, it is right for you to ask the government to fork out the entire amount. Well, I won't pursue that because I don't have a lot of time. The PS, the PS said that she is always confident that there will not be a budget overrun. If that's the case, why don't we just cap it, whether it is DBO or um, other modes? In those examples you quite quoted, you said that there will be a capped amount for the entire project, and any cost overrun would be shouldered by the contractor. Now, you said so, but where can we see this in your papers? Can you show me in which part of the paper you have given that undertaking? And then uh, for the sports sector, in discussing Central Kowloon route, I can see that after it is spilled, it's very close to the sports park. And according to the EIA report, whether it be NO2 or suspended particulates, there will be serious exceedance. So our athletes and members of the public will be taking in um, huge amounts of NO2 and suspended particulates when they do sports. If you put emphasis on the development of elite athletes, I'd like to ask you how you are going to tackle this pollution problem. Because if they take in NO2, they will suffer from shortness of breath and their performance will suffer. So what are the measures that you will take to tackle air pollution? P.S. I will ask, answer the first question first. We said clearly that we are asking for $31.9 billion, and it will cover the entire cost of building the sports park. And in only one circumstance, as we said in the paper, that we would need to apply for supplementary funding. And that is if the cost is not uh, because of um, some responsibility of the contractor. Say, for example, if we cannot hand over the site for the contractor to build the sports park, then it will be our responsibility to shoulder the cost overrun. But if it is caused by the contractor, it must be um, shouldered by the, uh, by the contractor. As for air pollution, we have already done an environment assessment, and the Environment um, Advisory Committee has already given us an environment permit that the air quality there would be suitable for the building of a sports park. And the central Kowloon route will be submerged into the ground um, in that section. No, P.S., if you have not read your papers 
clearly, I will tell you, according to the EIA, the residential developments will suffer from the NO2. Now, since the ventilation shafts will bring um, polluted air into a very high point. Uh, so you need to answer my question, but you are going to harm our athletes. Would there be measures to prevent uh, health impact on the athletes? I hope you will give time for the PS to answer my question because it is an important question. Okay, please press the button again. Can I ask uh, my colleague to answer? Mr. Yang? In 2015, we got funding from LegCo, and part of the money was spent on a very detailed EIA report. And at the time of different events being conducted at the sports park, we tried to assess the air quality. And all the EIA report has been given a green light by the EPD in the form of an environment permit. It is said that the air quality will be meeting requirements. But sorry, Commissioner. Let me interject. I know you have followed all the procedures. I'm not criticizing that you don't follow procedures, but these are two different projects. I don't know whether in your EIA report you have included the part of uh, Kowloon Central Route because that EIA report has told you about the air outlets, and it is said that people within certain diameters will suffer from NO2 and suspended particulates which would exceed the standard of 2014. You only did an EIA on Sports Park, but you have not factored in the Kowloon Central Route pollution. I am not asking you about procedures, but uh, you are harming the health of the sportsmen. Well, a clear and specific answer is that when we did our EIA, we already factored in the Kowloon Central Route, and still we found that we are meeting all statutory requirements. But then you were using the standards for the 80s, and you have exceeded the standard for 2014. Well, the EIA report was approved in 2017. Chairman, you are using different information. Uh, why don't you give me the EIA report that you did? Yes, please supply the information to Ms. Lao Siu Lai. Any other follow-up? But well, you don't have time anyway. Mr. Liang Kuo-hung, three minutes. This gentleman said that this is a matter of philosophy. You're wasting our time. We are not paying you to talk about philosophy. We are talking about definitions. You have not been able to answer it. You to come here as a philosopher. Come on. You are doing the PR here in terms of particular of rubbish, PR. What are you talking about? We are not coming here to discuss the quote-unquote philosophy with you. You need to be responsible. We pay the money for you not to come here to give us a false premises, and then the conclusion will become a distortion. It's a lie. You are a liar. We are paying you here not to do PR, not to talk about philosophy. We're asking you the definition, but you cannot answer my question. And you said we're moving the goalposts. I'll ask you again. What kind of philosophy are you talking about? Dr. Edward, you was very clear. There is a definition. If you do DBO, you should do financing at the beginning. Talk about philosophy. Don't insult philosophy. You are Plato. You don't need to come here. You don't need to come here to suck the money. Come on, give me a break. Do you want to deliver your apology to us? I'm serious. Say so. You give us sweet talk. It's not consultancy at all. Come on.
Shut your face. Shut your face. I'm telling you, don't laugh. This, this is a way we are talking about money. I'll ask you again. Edward Yu's definition is it a correct one? If it is correct, why are we paying the money? What are you talking about? Mr. Ray Chen, three minutes. I'd like to follow up the bid incentive issue. I understand that those who fail will be getting $60 million or half of the bidding cost. And if they have to apply for a bid incentive, they will have to give you the entire expense report. I'd like to ask whether that will be made public. And the winner, does he also have to let you know the financing for preparing the bid? I'm asking the question because I can see the sum done by the operating consultant. It's so huge. Chairman, find the time to read it. For example, supposing the consortium would have to use 223 people and the construction director will have to work for four months, being paid $270,000 every month, and then if they come to Hong Kong and then they get accommodation in Hong Kong, that will cost $7 million, and then office accommodation, $5 million, etc. I don't know about the assumptions and the projections. Is it that you are already in touch with potential bidders? Have you um, peeped into their calculations? Because I can't assess whether you have done your calculations correctly. That is why I would have to go back and ans ask the question. When they come to apply for the bid incentive, uh, would it be that those reports will not be made public because it contains commercial secrets? P.S. Well, to consolidate that question is whether anyone would be monitoring the information of the consultant report. Do you just trust the consultant? Chairman, in response to members' request, we have done the uh, calculations and we have used the man hour way, which is the easiest way to do the calculations. But as to how much money each bidder will have to use to prepare for the bid, we don't know. We are thinking 100 to 200 million dollars would be a reasonable amount because if we do a reference design and also in the last 18 months when we did advance work, we have already spent 110 million dollars on advance work. So we think 100 to 200 million dollars would be a reasonable sum. To answer Mr. Ray Chan, whether or not the bidders lose or win the bid, when they put in a bid, they have to let us know in the bid how much money has been put into the preparation of the bid. And if they fail, we will see uh, when they apply for $60 million, we will be able to check against the bid to see whether it's responsible. And there will be independent consultants for uh, to help us vet the calculations, and then we will have independent accountants to assess the situation, and we are going to ask for receipts before the $60 million would be given. So in the end, would this be a commercial secret uh, that is known only to you and the bidder? Chairman, all bidding information is confidential. We have to respect the entire tendering process. Nothing will be made public. I only have one lining up. I hope you will press the button if you want to ask a question. i like to remind members who are in the chamber in the chamber building, please come back. Mr. Ted Hoy said he did not have a chance to ask questions. Mr. Ted Hoy, if you are here, please come down to the room immediately. Mr. Wu Chi three minutes. Also like to ask about bid incentive. In all government infrastructural projects, if it is just the project design, of course it must be shouldered by the bidders. But for the sports park there are two parts. One, the engineering or construction part. The other one, the operating part. I'd like to ask you whether you can tell me why is it that now, of course, when they operate the sports park, they have to think of ways to make it popular. But the construction part, 
the bidder will, of course, have to find people to um, draw the plans, etc. So shouldn't the bid incentive be separated into two parts as well, one for the construction part, the other for operation? Because on the side of construction, it is just building the project. In fact, you don't even um, propose any bid incentive for the normal infrastructural projects. Is that, is that possible? Very secretary. Well, actually, under the DBO mode, the three parts cannot be separated. And we have said time and again that the advantage is that we can incorporate certain good design points of the failing bits. But then it will be neither fish nor file. You have said that the beauty of DBO is that there will be one operator who will be putting forward the entire plan from the beginning. Well, let me continue. We'd like to incorporate the best elements. Now, of course, if there are no good elements from the failing bits, we don't have to incorporate anything, but then we will be given the freedom to do so. And when we want to incorporate the best designs, we cannot say we will be able to take the best parts about operation but not the best parts about the design because every designer may have certain good um, design points uh, so that we can incorporate all of them. Dio 如果是我想委員你也同意就算是中標者他也未必是十全十美的我想委員你也同意就算是中標者他也未必是十全十美的我想委員你也同意就算是中標者他也未必是十全十美的唔該主席,我想跟進翻容資個問題,因為頭先有議員都問到就是點解即係Some members are said some in the mainland um there could be private financing of such projects but now we have to pay everything. The government might not be able to address that question. The um operational risks are shared but in terms of construction risks, well, all the, the financing risk is solely on the government. And um, some men, some members also query that um, the operators might have made a lot during the construction and they might not manage or operate the venue seriously. The PS said that um, you have done the math and if Financing is required. Um, contractors only have to pay a maximum of five percent, and if that's the case, um, it would be better for the government to fully own the venue. So, how did you come up with this percentage or five percent? You said that some venues are not profitable. For example, the public sports ground, indoor sports center, and public open space. But when you look at the figures. They do not make up the bulk of the expansion of the project. The um, cost of the main stadium is higher than all the costs um, for the um, remaining facilities. So how did you come up with the 5%? If the um, government continues to pay all the costs, how can you um, avoid, avoid um, any um, fabrications from uh, of the accounts by the contractors the government must tell us how this can be avoided and how they would conduct the monitoring so the first question how did you come up with the 5% there's an initiation um investment of 3 to 400 million dollars from the from the investor would you require them to pay more or, or contribute more secretary
apart from this consultancy study, in 2014, we compiled another consultancy report. And at that time, we pointed out that the um, scale and um, scope of the KTSP could not appeal to private investors. So um, before 2014, the government agreed internally that the project would be developed as a public works. And um, we no longer considered um, DFO or joint venture. If we um, go with joint venture, the government will own 95% of the shares of the company. So um, if we compare 95% and 5%, we decided that it would be better for the government to own the project wholly. And um, that way we can um, gain um, the maximum control. Under the DBO approach, well, we have explained that. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to know how they came up with the 5% for the profitable venues, including the um, commercial sites and main stadium. They make up the bulk of the revenue. The government does not have to be um, the um, sole owner in order to um, decide on the direction. So what is the logic behind the 95 and 5%? Who can take this question, Michael? Yeah. yeah. So the five percent was carried out by another consultant, so we, we can't comment specifically on the five percent. But what we can comment on is if a private sector group was required to fund an amount of money into this project beyond the amount that has already been discussed in this forum, they would need to raise debt funding and equity funding to support that. For that debt funding, against that debt funding, they would need to pay interest and repay the principal. And for the equity funding, they would need to pay a return on that equity capital to the ultimate investors. The point I'm making here is that by in introducing additional capital requirements, the financial feasibility of the project becomes challenged because of those repayment obligations and commitments. Yeah. How did they come up with the 5%? They decided not to disclose it. How did you come up with the 5%? They decided not to provide any explanation at all. So how can you convince us that this is the only financing option? Why can't the contractor be asked to pay more? And um, why can't you have more control? This way um, they would face more constraints. I'm extremely disappointed at not getting an answer. So perhaps you can wait for the next round. I would allow other members to speak first. Well, he could not answer the question. Secretary, um, or permanent secretary, as I said, the 5% um, did not come from the um, consultant sitting behind me. It was um, from Price Waterhouse Coopers in 2014, and the report was already uploaded online. And it was given to the um, PWSC and the Home Affairs panel. We can share this report with Mr. Law afterwards. My question was about the um, shouldering of the um, design and building costs by the government. According to your papers, you said you do not expect them to um, make profits beyond a um, specific level as for the entire project which costs more than three which costs more than thirty billion dollars you cited examples overseas other projects were not that large in scale they only cost a matter of few of billions of Hong Kong dollars so for this very big project how would you monitor um, its costs? Would there be any fabrication of accounts? Or um, have you adopted any extra measures? P.S. Chairman, in terms of design and build, um, the tender document is very detailed, and our payments are made according to the tender documents. We talked about price adjustment of ten billion dollars and if necessary um the government would pay that provision. 
as for future operation and the um, relevant costs um, audited accounts would be given to the government and um, profits would be shared based on that report. So um, the supervision is done by independent third party. I have one more question about the um, contingencies. As I understand, the um, bid incentives are paid for under the contingencies. Is that right? The um, $120 million is paid under the contingencies. So um, would you, um, in terms of the accounting, are you going to um, create a separate category? Commissioner, we have reserved $120 million under contingencies for the bid incentives. As for the, um, it, it really depends on the number of contractors who apply for such incentives. So um, this sum has been reserved under contingencies. We talked about the Shatin Central link earlier, and we face uh, an issue that some um, the um, numbers, some numbers, do not correspond. Some um, costs fall under contingencies. So, uh, in the future, for such um, costs, they should not be included under contingencies. They should be laid out clearly. Because some um, some people might assume that contingencies are only um, used for um, emergency scenarios during construction. So um, next time, you should um, have separate categories. I agree with Mr. Law. We would follow suit. The um, <laughs> number would be um, separated. Next time, Mr. Leung Yuchong, this tendering approach is unique and it's the first time this approach is used in Hong Kong. Apart from um, one stop tendering, um, bid incentives would be provided and there would be profit sharing with um, between the operator and government. The winning bidder would make substantial revenue. So that's why supervision on the um, winning bidder is important. Before the bidding um, result is announced, we have to make sure that um, the, the project is not tailor-made to um, any specific party. You talked about your scoring criteria and you said um, such criteria are not in place yet. After you drop these criteria, um, they would be passed on to the vetting committee as well as the central um, tendering committee. Which department is responsible for drawing up the um, tendering criteria? And um, before you hand over the um, information to the um, scoring committee, would you carry out extensive consultation. I don't want to give the imp the impression that some um, the tendering or the tender is tailor made to anyone in sp in particular. Secretary or PS Chairman, the um, vetting committee for the tendering exercise is similar as other tendering exercises. The HAB would form a vetting committee as to um, the final decision. The um, permanent secretary of the FSTB would decide. We have to make sure that the tenders must um, meet all our requirements in black and white before they would be um, considered in the next round. As for the second question, are you going to carry out consultation on this assessment scheme? In the past, we have um, seen cases in which um, tenders were tailor-made for specific parties. The, um, the tendering process is confidential. 
we know that some tendering exercises are tailor-made, especially in the IT sector. That's my biggest concern. We would not um, tailor-make tailor our tendering criteria for anyone. The tendering is open. The major tendering criteria has been shared with Let's Go, including the um, operation requirements. They have been shared with Let's Go. The, te the details cannot be announced before the tender result is out. Mr. Long, Mr. Long, please wait for the next round. Mr. Wuchi wife, two minutes. Thank you. I have two questions. The secretary said after they receive bids, they might conduct some screening and take in views. The nature of DBO means that the operator has to um, take care of everything related to design and building. If the um, vetting committee imposes certain requirements, so um, what would the um, division of uh, responsibility look like? According to the paper, um, in the um, breakdown under engineering, um, site investigation has been taken out. For budget overruns in our um, recent projects, um, the site investigation is often problematic. So for this project, has the um, site investigation been completed properly? To make sure that there won't be any um, unforeseeable um, ground or soil conditions. Secretary, let me address the first part first. Let me give an example. Let's say we receive three bits and um, they might be asked to submit proposals for an international competition. The winning bidder um, might propose an international competition. A, a, B, C, or they they might come up with three proposals A, B, C, but the the losing bidders might consider um, might propose some um, D, E, F, but um, we at the end we might consider all proposals. Site the um, site investigation has been paid for by uh, by the um, approved amount of sixty two million dollars earlier. Let's go. Um, the site does not involve. Archaeological sites, so um, there um, we are unlikely to see um, unforeseeable soil conditions. The um, consultancies, well, the the four successful cases did not. Um, deploy DBO, and um, for well, the, the definition is important. We cannot stick with the original definition of DBO and pay everything. The um, consultancy stated effects for DBO. Regardless of philosophy, there's no need to um, pay up in one go. And um, other approaches might um, lead to a better operation of DBO. So um, if you um, do not uh, um, cover that, what's the point of our discussions today? You stated four examples, but they um, were bogus examples. So um, this is a case of bad faith. What can we do? If you adopt DBO, of course, um, the larger the scale of the project, the better, because they don't have to pay for those um, expensive um, stadia. For example, the one that costs $8.8 .8 billion, they would go ahead. I, I'm not against other facilities, but the um, I'm only against the $8.8 .8 billion dollar super stadium. You are trying to demolish the one child sports ground, which is a favorite 
and um, you are trying, you are um, taking down the Hong Kong Stadium, and you um, did not tell us about the fascia. We are talking about uh, about good faith rather than bad faith. Please wait for the next round, Miss Eddie Chu. Three minutes, Chairman. Well, um, I like to talk about DBG for one final time, and I have a specific question. In the Annex 1 of the government's reply to my question, the government said that um, there would be 13 event days at the main stadium. Of, um, of those 13 um, days, um, how many concerts would, and how many um, sports events would be held? According to, to the consultancy, out of the 13 um, event days, um, there are um, 13 local entertainment events and seven sport events and three community events for a total of 13. Chairman, then I have this question. For the Hong Kong Coliseum, it is said that there is no vacancy slot and the queue is as long as uh, up to next year. So when you estimate that of 13 days, only three days will be used to hold concerts. Have you consulted the industry? Well, we're referring to the main stadium, Chairman. If you compare this with the Hong Kong Coliseum, I think that the direct comparison should be made with the indoor sports center with a seating capacity of about 10,000. For the main stadium, with a capacity of 50,000, it is a reasonable estimate that three days would be used for holding concerts for a local singer to have to hold a concert at the stadium with 50,000 audience. Well, that's more or less three days. But we're, if if we're able to attract international celebrities, then the number of days may be longer. Chairman, I don't get it. I don't understand why. The government is so-called outsourcing this stadium's operation, and then the, there'll be three days for concerts. And if it's DBO, then the number of days will significantly increase. I want to know whom you have consulted before you reach a conclusion of uh, holding three days of concerts a year. P.S. In Hong Kong, for somebody to attract 50,000 or 30,000 audience, sorry, Chairman, I don't have time. I asked whether they consulted anyone. Well, that's the information we get when consulting the local entertainment industry. But we have also been told that there are international well-known singers who are interested in coming to our stadium to hold concerts there. So, Chairman, in short, I'm asking whether the government can calculate once again the um, the uh, income and expenses if we adopt the DBG. Well, please keep his mic on for the st main stadium and retail dining facilities. Can we not base the estimate on these assumptions? That is the estimated income And get um, you know um, the middle figure because I think that you're taking the, the well. This uh, estimate is too conservative, so uh, please try to be fair. Any response? Well, I emphasized just now that we cannot base our estimates on our own subjective thinking. This is the information we get after consulting the um, sector. And I cannot put up a nicer figures uh, by using the, the, the middle figures because of that, Mr. Jeremy Tam. I still want to follow up on the $60 million which have disappeared. According to your explanation, Although previously the bid incentive was decreased from 180 to 120 million dollars, the sum, after all, came from the contingency provision, which is about 10 percent of the total project cost. And therefore, you are not going to change the contingency provision. 
So for the total uh, funding funding applied for, that is uh, $31.898 billion. You're not going to change the amount, but I am astonished by your reply because about the um, uh, for the contingency provision, uh, roughly two point three million billion dollars. Originally, you you did not reserve any portion for that, um, but now you have reserved some for the for the incentive, meaning that the contingency provision for contingencies would be less, and that there would be a higher risk of cost overrun. So, be it one hundred and twenty or one hundred and eighty million dollars, we ask how you're going to deal with that, and your reply. Was that that's true? The contingency provision would be smaller, so that we'll keep a closer eye and make sure that there won't be cost overrun. So, in fact, you uh, it will make things easier in the future. You don't really need to provide for contingencies because if you keep a closer eye on the project, you won't be able to uh, face your uh, cost overrun. But is that really the huge attitude? Is uh, the the attitude that you should adopt? How can the government act like this? That uh, you can, well, since uh, the budget is more relaxed, you can use it as an incentive. Who would take this question? Well, just now, Mr. Jeremy Tam referred to the contingency provision, which exists in every project, and would not. Um, provide expressly what con contingency it means. We just provide the lump sum as a contingency provision to cope with uncertain factors, and uh, and uh, indeed, in the course of uh, this project, we propose the bid incentive. And we don't want to increase the amount that we're applying for, and that is why uh, it has to come out from the contingency provision. We admit that. Now it will be capped at $120 million, meaning that it will come from the $2.3 billion contingency provision. And uh, that also means that the provision for true contingencies would be less. We admit that. Just now, before Mr. Jeremy Tam came in, we also agree with Mr. Nathan Law's suggestion. In the future, this contingency provision should be should be set out very clearly, so that uh, during the final settlement stage, we must set out what the contingency provision has been used for, and we also need to have a breakdown of the incentive. And we have already promised that, Chairman. Well, of course, you need to. Set out clearly how you utilize the contingency provision, even not upon members' request, because it amounts to two point something billion dollars. But what I don't agree with is that the contingency provision is now smaller because of the bid incentive. But then you are going to keep a close eye on the project so that there will not be cost overrun as a result. But that's your responsibility. You are supposed to. Fulfill your duty and watch closely the project. Whereas we mentioned in the paper, there are indicators to follow to make sure that there is no cost overrun on the part of the contractor unless the request comes from the government. The contractor will be required to uh, foot the bill. Next, Dr. Pierre Chen. Now, at present, the members of the public can uh, pay an affordable fee to um, hire the use of football uh, pitches, and according to the paper, the uh, facilities will be um, publics will be charged a, a, a similar rate for using facilities in Kaitak Sports Complex. And this could be called a benefit for the sports enthusiasts. Who are also taxpayers, but in the future, the operator will be operating the f the park on a self-financed basis. So I want to know how they're going to um, pack their rate with the LCSD rate to make it sustainable. P.S. Our requirements would be set will be uh, set out in the contract. 
In terms of community facilities, the fees to be charged will be comparable to the fees charged by LCSD managed venues, and the uh, fee level will be subject to approval by the HAB Home Affairs Bureau. So they may, they could be um, not making any profit or even incurring losses, but that's part of the package of the DBO. In terms of other facilities such as the um, retail and dining facilities, main stadium, etc., the revenue generated from these facilities could make up for the loss for community facilities, so that at the end of the day, they can strike a fiscal balance and even split the profit with the government. I thank you for the answer. I'd like to follow up on the main stadium. The government is spending uh, eight hundred and eighty million dollars to ca to build a stadium with fifty thousand seating capacity, and there should be uh, uh, there would be less than ten uh, sports events, uh, or at least ten sports events every year. So, how can you ensure that at least ten events would be held with a sufficient um, audience? Because uh, just now, as mentioned by the other member for the previous e event, um, there wasn't enough audience. So if you need to uh, earn more for some facilities in order to make up for the loss of other facilities, how can you make sure that there would be at least 10 such events to make up for the losses? And if this is not uh, this is not done in the future, would there be any penalty system who would take your question, uh, Commissioner? Will set out in a contract that the the contractor the or the operator will be required to hold ten matches at least. They could be te local um, teams or uh, visiting teams. We need to make it explicit because for local matches we may not be able to attract ten thousand um, people as audience. So we need to encourage. Operators to hold more football matches uh, at the same time in the main stadium, and this will be uh, set out in the contract. It seems that my question hasn't been answered. I want to know whether the contractor will be penalized, or that whether the uh, the contractor or the operator will uh, pay for the loss. Well, at present, for Hong Kong Stadium, the, uh, there is an agreement between the LCSD Hong Kong Football Association on the number of uh, matches to be held uh, in the stadium, and there will be um, and there is a minimum charge, and there will be more if more matches are held. And we are also going to implement a similar arrangement with the Hong Kong Football Association to make sure that the fee level will be set at a reasonable level in the opinion of the Hong Kong Football Association so that more matches can be held in the future. There are two members, Dr. Edward Yu and Ms. Lau Siu Lai, waiting to ask questions. And I appeal to members who are in their office or uh, to come back to ask questions or to their assistants to come back if they want to ask questions. So we're, because we have spent five hours asking questions, and Mr. Ted Hoi and some of the members claim that they did not have the, the chance to ask questions. So do come back as quickly as possible, or else I will just stop the uh, questioning session, and you will have to be responsible for that. Dr. Edward, you one minute. Uh, sorry, his mic is not on. Uh, this is not a speculation. Last time he asked why he didn't get the chance to ask questions, that's why I appealed to him to come back and ask questions. Well, even if you ask the assistants to come back, you will be criticized. You should inform the members directly. But they, if they're not watching webcasts, how can I personally contact members? Many members are contacted through assistance. But anyway, you have your own perspective. Ms. Dr. Edward, you one minute now. Secretary, uh, I just try to be f uh, good. Now I am using, I mean, we're using different definitions. We have different term in terms. Uh, my my term is uh, World Bank's DBO, and your term is uh, um, a philosophical DBO. So you have 
you have um, given us four successful examples using the philosophical DBO, not the World Bank's DBO. What about this uh, Kitech project? You suggest that the World Bank DBO should be used instead of the philosophical DBO. So um, I want to uh, make it convenient for you. Can you just follow the four examples raised by the consultant using the uh, the uh, philosophical DBO using the uh, the the one of the example the the minim the minimum uh, example that is only to pay four percent by the consortium. Who would like to take the question, Michael? Thank you. No, no, I direct the question at uh, secre secretary. No, let the expert answer first. If you're so concerned about this issue, I'll give you some more minutes. Please understand that at the end of the day, this committee is about asking questions. Please don't move a motion to adjourn the debate. Please try to ask questions or you'll be given less time to speak. I will ask the consultant to speak before the secretary uh, speaks. We'll spend three or four minutes on it. Michael. Thank you for the comments and question. Um, I understand the point you're making about definition and the World Bank. I understand where you're coming from, and definition is important with these things. Um, the point we're making is that the definitions for DBO and other procurement models can vary from market to market and from authority to authority. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, there's another authority, Bank Watch, which is an authority backed by the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the European Commission, and the European Investment Bank, and their definition uh, suggests a concession to run a service is not a public-private partnership. However, the construction and operation of a highway or other project would be. Because the private sector is responsible for financing and participating in several stages of the project, and for example, DBO or BOT. So the point I'm making is the definitions for these models differ from authority to authority. And where we come back to here is we have to look to the substance of the contract, the substance of the procurement model. And our view, and you may have a different view, our view is that the substance of the concept is about design, build, operate in a single consortium. And the, that, is the, that is the approach for Kitak Sports Park, and that is also the approach for the examples we provided. So I hope this gives you more clarity on our perspective on this matter. Secretary. Your view? Well, I really agree with you. The substance of these four examples is that the consortium winning the bid will have to pay for part of the cost. So that's the substance. Secretary, you should follow the global trend, the four philosophical DBO examples. The consortium should pay part of the cost. Secretary, I understand Dr. Yu as uh, well, he is a uh, uh, lecturer, so from an academic point of view, he may have a lot to say, but when he, we're, we're actually having a mood discussion on academic points, and I understand that different world organizations may have different definitions on uh, on a single subject, which is normal. If we continue with this argument, I don't think it is necessary. On the other hand, uh, we should focus on how this should actually be implemented in terms of Hong Kong's project. We may have different theories, but we should also pay attention to what's actually happened here. But these are four actual examples. Like Dr. Yu said, the consultant gave four examples. In, and in these examples, they adopted different approaches. And in Hong Kong, in light of the actual situation, we should adopt our own approach. We'll just follow any one of these examples. I say that it is impossible. It is uh, important to consider the actual circumstances in Hong Kong because, in the example of the Asia World Expo or the Hong Kong Disneyland, we had the joint financing approach. That is uh, what what was championed by uh, Dr. Lau Siu Lai. But according to these examples, we don't find this model satisfactory. On this occasion, we have, well, then why don't you give me four other successful examples, which, uh, well, Secretary, I have to stop you here. No need to continue. Three minutes, next member, Claudia Mo, because uh, your, your time is up. 
We have so many white elephant projects in Hong Kong. So whenever we come across a major pro large scale project, we feel alarmed. Now this is about a $32 billion project in Kitex Sports Complex. And uh, all of a sudden you propose to have a bid incentive for the losing bidders. Each will be given $60 million. Now there is per, uh, per repercussion in this council from members from different political parties and 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 the compensation is estimated at 60 million dollars but now we understand that uh, you're not really uh, saving 60 million dollars uh, it's a it's a deception and then you claim that because the project is of such a uh, huge scale that you need to attract more bidders. I think that we're at loggerheads. Find some experts to tell us why this economic model is better, financial model is better, and why not the other model. But at the end of the day, I think it's just empty talk. The chairman is sitting in the middle, and I think he is in a difficult position because we don't find the answers acceptable up to now. This is a huge project. We have to be responsible to the next generation. We all support sports, but in Hong Kong, you are giving us all these infrastructural projects. It's hard to swallow the XRL Hong Kong section, uh, Sha Tin Central Line, the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, so on and so forth, and now this Kai Tak Sports Park. But do you think Hong Kong is really a stable and prosperous society? What about old ladies picking up cartons and being prosecuted by the FEHD for selling the carton for one dollar. I, I know this is not a very appropriate an analogy, but this is out of proportion, what you are doing. I think it is not very meaningful for us to carry on this conversation. If you ask me what questions I have, I would say you are holding your ground and you are not making concessions, no matter what questions are being asked you will still be insisting on your calculations and your principles, and you will just stand your ground. You are not willing to make any concessions. Is that right? Secretary, Chairman, we went through the PWSC. We have incorporated a lot of members' views, and this is already an, an improved uh, option. Mr. Uh, Dr. Pierre Chan, three minutes. Thank you, Chair. In paper, a previous paper, it is said that for two thirds of the time, the indoor sports center must be used for sports activities or for hire by the public. But we understand that there are stipulations on the opening up of certain clubs to the public. And in fact, they usually do not comply with the requirements, and there is no mechanism to deal with them. Let me come back to the indoor sports center. Supposing not all, not two thirds of the time available is used by the public, then uh, what measures can you take to require the contractor to comply? P.S. or secretary, uh, who would you like to answer? Oh, I don't mind whoever answers it. P.S. As we said in the paper. The HA Bureau and the operator's CEO will set up a monitoring committee. Every year, we will look at the bookings for that year. Every month, we will review the booking schedule. So one year ahead of time, we'll be able to know whether time slots would be reserved for required programming like sports or seven days for the government's uh, public interest programs. All that would be arranged um, in advance. Uh, there will be no question of not meeting the target. You said you would set up a monitoring committee. Is that within the contractor's company or it, what kind of a group is that? Chairman. In the paper submitted to the PWSC, 
we detailed the future monitoring system. There will be two tiers. On the top tier, uh, including myself and the commissioner, that is the HA Bureau, and the CEO and other staff of the contractor. Now, we will be sitting on the first tier. And then under it, there will be smaller groups watching over the different areas of operation, and they will hold meetings every month. And the secretary also mentioned that stakeholders will be setting up a consultative or advisory committee. So there will be three tiers of monitoring or consultative committees. Well, I understand. I have read the papers. That is why I'm asking the question. I'm saying if indeed the targets are not met, what kind of consequences there are? We have seen um, different scenarios, and yet it seems we have not been able to deal with those. So let us ask this question at this stage. Uh, I, I hope you can help us resolve that. Mr. Alvin Young, I'd like to ask about the contracting out of the operation. I want the Bureau to give me a detailed answer because you say you support sports. But I'd like to understand whether um, the only option is for contracting out. Well, actually, remember in 2009, um, our athlete got a gold medal for the small wheel biking competition. But Mr. Stephen Wong has retired, and BMX is not a supported program anymore. And the venue in Hong Kong is not maintained. But indeed, there are young children in Hong Kong who are still engaged in BMX. You said you would like to popularize sport, and indeed people responded. And yet, the major venue is uh, quite dilapidated, and they are only doing it in the training ground. And in fact, if the ground is not even, if it is not maintained, it's quite dangerous. Now, they are using soil mud in order to fill the potholes, but it doesn't work. So when you say you want to contract out the operation and when the contractor will tender for subcontractors to fill the potholes, etc., um, the tendering exercise can be abortive, but we are only talking about like $1 million in order to maintain the present venue. So when you face these contractors, of course, you have the guidelines and requirements. But this kind of contracting out system, is that a desirable approach? You say you will apply the same thing to the sports park. Can you explain to me and try to convince the public that now you can't even maintain a BMX venue. How can I trust you that given Kai Tech, which is such a huge project, that we should be reassured by you? P.S. or Commissioner? Chairman, Mr. Young mentions a venue. Actually, it is not contracted out. It is a restored landfill. The Biking Alliance applied for the venue for training in, in BMX, we allowed them to develop the venue. And this kind of approach is quite usual overseas and in Hong Kong, and also like the Rugby Association, it applied for a site and then it operated the venue itself. Let us talk about this Kwai Chung venue. Mr. Young said that uh, people would like to contract out to maintain the venue, but then the tendering exercise was aborted. But uh, this is only technical. They were poised to maintain the venue, to maintain it as a training ground, but now they have to retender. There is some delay, but I can put simply that this is not a contracting out mode, and you cannot compare that with Kai Tech. Well, look, the commissioner is saying that it is the problem of the other party. It is not the government's responsibility. Is that right? This is what I hear. Commissioner, well, in simple terms, the Biking Alliance applied for the venue for training purpose, and it would be responsible for managing, more managing and uh, operating the venue. So it is not any kind of contracting out. Mr. Jeremy Tam, three minutes. Chairman, I'd like to ask a question on the paper you gave us today, and that is question three on Kai Tech. And uh, in the last pages of your appendix, like in appendix two, 
you said that the operating consultant has done this um, prediction on the basis of work hours. Now, I don't know why some positions are so expensive. For example, catering um, consultant daily pay $5,000. If he works five days a week, every month he will fetch $100,000. And then security consultant, again, $5,000 a day, $100,000 per month. The same for architect and the civil engineer, the same thing. And then others are getting $6,500 a day, so more than 100000 a month. And then quality assurance people, I don't know that they are so highly paid, $5,500 per day or $110,000 a month. And then the project coordinator, $4,500, so it's about $90,000 a month. Let us look at a quantitative surveyor. Again, 110000 per month. From what I understand about the market, these are not the monthly salaries that should be paid. How did you come up with these calculations? What were the standards by which you did your calculation? Who will take the question? We'll ask the consultant to answer because, sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah. Yeah, th thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, no, it's a good question, and um, I've worked on a lot of tenders myself, and so I know the pressures that uh, you're under in these circumstances. Um, the, the tender offers that will be made will bind the consortium into fulfilling their obligations on a lump sum basis for the design build and for around 20 years for the operations. So the work undertaken in a relatively short period of six months has to be accurate and include risks on the design build because it is a lump sum and the upside and downside risk on the operations. Um, as you can see in the table, we, we've estimated a team of about 200 people um, will be needed to complete the tender in the, in the six months we're giving them. Um, on, on to the people themselves, um, this, this is high level work. It's, it needs to be accurate and it needs to be fast because we haven't got a lot of time to put this together. So in terms of how we've uh, estimated the salaries of people. You, you are right, it's kind of a $100,000 a month average for, for people, but they are all senior experienced people that will be needed to put this together, um, not only for the design build part of it, but for the operations. It's, it's a very complex tender. So um, you, you're right, if you look at the bottom line, we're looking at $187 million. I think, uh, as, as the PS said before, you know, the range of one to two hundred million is 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 what we expect. This is calculation shows a number to the to the uh, the higher end of that. Uh, my own experience is is that uh, uh, tender costs are up to about one percent of the of the value of the project, um, given the complexity. And this is definitely at the the more complex end of the these uh, tenders. So so I hope that answers your questions. Thank you. Oh, hi. Next, Mr. Eddie Chu, two minutes. Thank you, Chair. Just now, the Secretary, during the break, uh, came to talk to me to say if you go on with DBG, you will um, have no results. Now, I'd like to ask a question which will give me a result. Uh, Mr. Alvin Young mentioned the BMX venue. I'd like the Secretary to answer that question. Can you promise us that you will talk to the Cycling Alliance, if they have a maintenance or m operating problem, can the government promise that uh, $20 billion for 26 items? Can you add one more? So the 27th item would be for the BMX venue to be managed by the government, so you give some hope to the children. Secretary, Chairman. This is outside the purview of the uh, discussion today, but since the Commissioner mentioned it, we will respond to this. We have been talking to the Cycling Alliance. As the Commissioner said, we'll continue to negotiate with the Association. Are you saying that you would consider that one of the options is for the government to take it back because it is like a burden for the Alliance? Is it possible for you to consider Taking it back. Well, I can't tell you about any possible decision, but I would only um, 
promise that we will continue our discussion with the Cycling Association. Anything else, Mr. Eddie Chu? Yes, something else. I'd like to talk about the Wan Chai Sports Ground and its future. I was able to talk to the secretary, and the secretary said that the TDC will do a feasibility study first, so they will wait for the result of the study first. My question is, while the TDC does the study, can you consult the public to gauge the views of the public vis-a-vis -vis the significance of the Wan Chai Sports Ground? Now, if many people would already tell you to stop, then you might not need the feasibility study at all. So you don't have to wait for the feasibility study to end before you consult the public. Well, we'll just follow the established schedule. Well, now I will again call upon members to come here to ask questions. If not, we'll just um, terminate the questioning. Mr. Alvin Young, two minutes. Chairman, I will continue to follow up on my previous question. I still have questions for the commissioner. I agree that the PMX venue has not been contracted out, but in terms of the nature, you are also handling it over to an organization like KaiTech. In other words, the government will be able to wash its hands of it. But you have operating guidelines or requirements, right? How can you make sure that KaiTech will not follow the suit of the BMX venue that it will become bankrupt and quite dilapidated. I have not seen um, you reassuring us how KaiTech will not be the same. Secretary, well, there is a vast difference between the two. At KaiTech, the biggest impetus is that at the time of tendering, the bidders will know that they have 20 years to operate the venue and they will be able to make a profit. But of course, there will be profit sharing with the government. Every time there is an event, a, a concert or a match, the operator will certainly want to maintain the venue because they want to hold the next event. So we are not very worried about maintenance. Rather, we would set targets. We will state our requirements up front, and then in the interim, we will go through all the targets or indicators to see whether the operator passes the test. Maintenance is their responsibility, but if in the interim there is major maintenance to be done, the government will pick up the tap. So it will not happen as uh, you pictured. Uh, what do you mean by targets or indicators? Can you give me an example? Well, yes, those are in the paper. But we can again supplement it for you after the meeting. Okay, Jeremy Tam, two minutes. Thank you, Chair. Let's follow up on my previous question about the calculation of work hours and that table. I was talking about the daily pay for the staff of the operator. I believe the future bidder will get this table as well. And my worry is that if they fail the bid and then they apply for the bid incentive, so they will set out a, re a, a, a bill, an invoice to you basing on this table. If that's the case, is there a mechanism for you to ensure that indeed so much money is paid to their staff and indeed they have not um, exaggerated the budget? For those who are going to fail the bid, how can you ensure that they have actually expended a certain amount? It is not that you would have to do your own estimate judging from the people they have engaged. Well, that is only good for the $60 million that you might pay the losing bidders. I'm just worried whether this table will be exploited by them because they know this to be your estimation so they can um, exaggerate their claim. Say, the fire services consultant, how can you make sure that such a consultant has been engaged and how much that consultant has received to make sure that indeed the amount has been paid? Secretary, P.S. As I said in answering another question, when they place the bid, 
they already have to let us know what kind of bid incentive they may apply for. Of course, there is going to be a cap. And after the tendering process, when we indeed issue the bid incentive, we want to look at all the invoices. They will let us know how many staff members have been engaged, how many work hours have been uh, used, um, unless they would forge the documents. Uh, otherwise, we'll be able to ask our own auditor to check the accounts to see whether indeed um, this is the market rate, say whether for people of a certain kind of experience and background, whether they should be paid uh, a certain hourly rate. We have that uh, procedure to verify the accounts. Would you ask for audited accounts to be submitted to you from the bidder? Well, we will ask independent auditors to uh, check the accounts before we would allow the bid incentive. I want to follow up on the um, paper number 192, which was provided at noontime. It talked about the um, construction of the three main venues and um, some people ask whether they could be built se separately. I would like to know whether they would be commissioned or, or and completed together, or could they be commissioned at different times? Commissioner, we hope that they could be commissioned together. We understand that there are um, ancillary facilities to the venue. In terms of the um, transport auxiliary facilities, do you have figures to share with us? For the auxiliary facilities, there would be a station square, which is the station for the um, Sha Tien Central link. We are carrying out feasibility study or we are carrying out a study for the station square and hopefully we can apply for funding very soon. In um, paragraph 1, you talked about DBG and the government is very humble in saying that they do not think they are capable of managing it. And you talked about difficulties with the non-price factors. Can you give us some examples on the um, difficulties you encountered? or the um, use of the venue, etc. As a former um, director of the LCSD, I encountered a number of such cases. I wouldn't be specific, but for certain catering facilities, we try to um, lower the um, proportion of price and increase the proportion of quality, but this is difficult. And um, a lot of reasons were, were given on why the um, prices submitted were different from other bidders. I do not want to go into the specifics. Mr. Ted Hurry, five minutes. I'd like to thank the chairman for your reminder. I'd like to um, talk about a point of order. I'd like to remind you that members have the right to um, think of better questions after listening to the government and um, the views of other members. So um, even if you um, ask me to to come here, don't even um, think about. Um, shortening our speaking time. That's a gentle reminder to you. The Kai Tech Sports Park serves to promote sport. Some members talked about the Wan Chai Sports Ground. So between the two venues, is there any coordination? What is the relationship between the both? You said um, you are conducting some studies on the Wan Chai Sports Ground on the future mode of operation. You um, have not even told us what facilities would be there. But for the um, KTSP, you have specific plans. Do you think um, there is no correlation between the two? Or do you have a strategy or, or plan for both? Secretary, thank you very much. 
in terms of sport development, we do not just focus on these two venues. We look at the um, development in the entire territory over the next 10 years. Studies are ongoing for the Wan Chai Sports Ground. In this year's policy address, the chief executive has committed to financial resources in the next five years on um, sports facilities, including sports stadium, um, sports grounds, and new swimming pools. With the KTSP and other facilities on the district level, we can promote popular sport as well as mega events. This way we can um, promote sport development as a whole. The sports sector is working very hard and um, they have made very good accomplishments. So um, we feel that we are obliged to enhance sport facilities as a, as a whole. And um, our work actually goes beyond that. Apart from the um, dozens of projects we listed for the next five or ten years, in the next five years we will plan even more sport facilities. Today we are talking about the KTSP and in the next few years we are planning another sports park at Park Shack. Well, I have those information on hand. On the um, controversy whether one Chai Sports Ground should be demolished, um, those who support the demolishment would say that um, we are going to have the KTSP. So um, can you tell us clearly whether there is a correlation between the two? Would the um, Kitech Sports Park have facilities lacking in one Chai Sports Park or Sports Ground? If that is the case, I would um, make a direct comparison between the both when I um, cast my vote. Can they complement one another? As I said, we would look at the um, facilities all over Hong Kong, and um, we hope that we can develop these facilities as a whole. And um, we are still waiting for the report on the um, one Chai Sports Ground. Of course, members have the right to leave their questions till the end, but um, the chairman also has the right to um, stop the discussions if no one have questions to ask. I think uh, most members would appreciate the chairman's reminders instead of the other way around. Dr. Chen Chong Tai, three minutes. Thank you. Well, we are just doing our jobs, whether there are private sentiments, that's another matter. In terms of the financial arrangements, the paper um, talked about the um, mode of construction of the three main venues, and um, they said that those venues are complementary to each other. Details were given, including the central kitchen of the main stadium, the temporary staff for major events, traf um, transport facilities such as um, bus laybys and taxi stands. If the um, facilities at the KTSP are complementary to each other and the um, public space must be connected to the other facilities and um, there must be coordination between the facilities and they have to support one another. If they are not built as a whole, it would be um, regretful. I like the government to tell us how they arrived at such conclusion. You talked about the um, um, uh, you talked about the different venues complementing each other. If the um, sports park is not built as a whole, what did you specifically mean, Satri or PS? We are talking about a sports park. And um, there are three independent facilities, the uh, main stadium, um, public sports ground, and indoor sports center. And um, the, three are the three are closely tied. They are all located on the same platform. 
if they are built separately at different times, the um, facilities cannot complement one another, and the same facilities might have to be incorporated in all three venues, and the um, the use of resources would not be optimal if they can be developed together. For instance, if we have a central kitchen in the main stadium, it can support other events um, at the public sports ground and indoor sports center, so um, resources can be used more effectively. This is what we call holistic design or planning. I would agree with um, Dr. Edward Yu on this. For DBG or DBO, well, especially DBO, market competition is an emphasis. How could you introduce market competition to offer more flexibility? In terms of operation, why don't you introduce market competition in order to enhance quality? Why are you adopting this holistic approach, which would lead to a monopoly? Um, I don't really quite catch his point. Under DBO, um, we are embracing the private market. The speaker is not coming through. Please wait for the next round. Mr. Lang Kuo Hong, one minute. Dr. Lao Siu Lai, one minute. Well, it's my turn. This, discuss, um, this discussion is rather frustrating because the government has been um, citing successful examples of projects using DPO, and they are trying to convince us that this is the best approach. But um, you were exposed as uh, and um this is not the this is not the case or the truth i'm more concerned about air quality you said that the air quality passed the um eia but we are talking about environmental impacts of the project when um for the central Kowloon route project air quality was compromised and um no2 and um rsp levels were above um, the limit, and would this um, dirty air harm the health of our athletes? And um, would it would it help with elite sport development? Can you tell us how you would improve the situation? When the um, EIA report was compiled, we have considered the surrounding developments. Are you saying that the um, CIK the CKR report was um, lying. We have considered the impacts from surrounding developments, and the um, report was approved by the um, EPD, and the report was uploaded online. I'm talking about the um, harms to the health of athletes. Can you um, work with her with that after the meeting? This is Lang Kuang, one minute. We are at a crucial juncture because the consultancy gave us a very good example. The government said that DBO has been successful in other countries, and um, the government said that they complied with the um, World Bank standards. Well, um. I hope that the consultants would not waste our money. The government said that the DBO approach um, complies with the World Bank standards, but is this really necessary? You are um, trying to involve unnecessary people or parties. The um, financing party should be involved, and um, if they um, leave after nine months and um there's no um there are no stakes for them. I would not proceed to the vote today. Next Miss Claudia Mo. Thank you. Sometimes you are rather nice and honest. Hong Kong has 
too many white elephant infrastructure projects which also um face budget overruns and we are talking about hundreds of millions of dollars and um very often they are about the um ground conditions for the Kitex Sports Park do we have any um basement works? Would excavations be needed for car parks or the main stadium, or do you have no plans yet? Are you um going to wait for the design submitted by the tenderers? The um design for this project is very different from the West Kowloon Cultural District. We have no um major basement under the sports park. Um, there is a road called Shinkai Road. So um the entire KTSP must be um built on an elevated level on a platform. Um there's a car park underneath and as well as an unloading area. So um the um car park is located at grade and um no excavation is needed. Are you telling us that the entire project does not involve any um underground works? Of course piling is required, but there is no basement. Everything is built above ground, so um we would not face some um, soil or ground issues. Is that right? We did conduct site investigation as well as archaeological assessment, and um there are no re relics at the site um for the rest, I will wait for the next round. Mr. Nathan Law, three minutes. Thank you. The government has been advocating DBO instead of DBG because of financial and operational reasons. They said that um, by adopting DBO, um, the strings of the market could be um, realized. I'd like to talk about the supplementary information. They um, talked about the um, average rents of retail and catering facilities under both approaches the difference is substantial under DBO um eighty four dollars per square feet and um for DBG thirty six dollars per square foot so um the difference is substantial. How did you arrive at such conclusions? For eighty eighty four dollars per square foot you said you took reference from the um neighboring um, retail market as for the um figure of thirty six dollars per square foot. If you take reference to um neighboring markets, would it still be thirty six dollars? So what is the um reason for this substantial gap? Other members have asked the same question, but I would let the government explain it once more. As for the um monthly rents of eight hundred and forty and three hundred sixty dollars per month. We took reference from the um shopping centers privately operated um in Wang Tai Sin and Kowloon City. We might not be able to um satisfy the needs of certain private operators. So for D for DBG the um Expected rent is three hundred sixty dollars per month. This is a reasonable estimation. Can the government provide more information? The um rent of thirty six dollars per square foot lacks um an objective basis. The government prefers DBO because um they often cite a lack of experience in um running commercial facilities. Can you give us a clear formula or standards so that um in order to convince the public that the government will not do a good job? Perhaps I would ask our operational consultant to um explain more about the reference design and this rental level. Michael? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for the question. Um, I think it's worth explaining the method that we took to arrive at these numbers to, to answer your question. 
So for, for the DBO model, because it would be operated by a private sector team, we have assumed that they would be able to design and operate this in an optimal manner to achieve uh, rental rates that are equivalent to those in the surrounding areas for comparable privately, privately run facilities. For the DBG, we took a different approach. So the approach involved uh, an assessment of the original design that was prepared by government and looking at the quality of that design and its ability to secure tenants and uh, attract consumers to, to them all. And on the advice of our specialist retail consultant, it was determined that that design was suboptimal. So as a result of that suboptimal design, they formed a view of a rental level as described in, in the papers that you've got before you for the DBG, which yes, is dramatically lower. Now, the, the positive feature for the DBO model in this respect is that by pushing the design responsibility to the private sector, you do get the benefit of their expertise to design a facility that is effective and functional and optimal, as opposed to government, which does not have the same depth and level of expertise in designing and operating facilities of this nature. I hope that answers your question more clearly. I need to make an announcement. Mr. Eddie Chu has submitted seven questions raised in accordance with ROP 21, and I have made the decision. I can uh, hand out the rulings in a moment in bilingual uh, language. I have um, voted, I have. Um, rejected six of them, and I approved only one. Let me just finish with the housekeeping matters. I will deal with the 37A motions first, and then we will deal with the motions moved under 21 of the rules of procedure, which is unprecedented. So go back and think about it. According to the uh, rules, you have, each will be given three minutes, and once your round is up, we will proceed to vote. So in short, the mover will be given three minutes to speak, as usual, and then other members will be given three minutes to speak each. And then the mover, Mr. Eddie Ju, will be able to speak for another three minutes to reply, and then we'll proceed to vote. Now, uh, tomorrow I'll continue to allow members to ask questions. Some members have already asked five times, but let's finish it as soon as possible. Otherwise, I'll need to set a deadline. And after the questions are over, I'll move on to motions moved under 37A. So don't spend too much time on 37A. Uh, we need to f do the 21 as well. We haven't tried that before, and that's what we will do. We will go through the 37A motions first. And then we will deal with the motion moved by Mr. Eddie Ju under 21 of the Rules of Procedure. Now it says that the on the first of seven uh, on the first of July 2018, the financial secretary can use the uh, funds, but no sooner. Uh, that is to say, do members agree with Mr. Eddie Ju's motion to amend the proposal? That is. The financial secretary cannot use the funds before the 1st of July 2018. Do you agree with that? If uh, you can debate on it, and then we will pr uh, proceed to vote on it. Can we move amendment to his motion? No. I have thought about it already, so I can answer you right away. Otherwise, it will be endless if you continue to move mo amendments to his motion. We have no time. We have, I've been given notice days ago, and if you can move amendments to his motion, then it uh, will be endless. Well, I should amend it to 2008 instead of 2018. Well, you can do it next time. Any other questions? If not, then let's not waste time. We'll adjourn now and resume at 8.45 tomorrow. Thank you.